Well, welcome. So good to be with you today here at InFocus Church and wherever you're watching from right now, and whether it's YouTube or Facebook or whatever the case may be, we're glad that you're here. And as I was watching that video, I couldn't help but just be reminded of how powerful, uh, loving, and sovereign our God is. We shot that video a few weeks ago, actually, in preparation for Big Gift Sunday that's coming up, not having any clue as to where we would be today, uh, which is us here and you not here, uh, but elsewhere. And yet, as Emerson was sharing his testimony about putting his hope and trust in God at the very end, talking about putting and investing in the kingdom of God, that it's, it's a better investment, obviously, than the stock market or other places that could fail. And, and look at where we are at this point in time. But the greatest investment that we could ever make with the most sure return is the kingdom of God. So I hope that encourages you. Again, we're glad that you're here today in our virtual church, if you will. And I mean that in the sense that physically gathering together in the name of Jesus and under the banner of his name has been the mark of the Christian church throughout all of history. But then here we are today and I'm preaching to an empty room uh, except for my friends that are here up on stage as we are uh, on the social distancing thing as well. And they're, they're as far apart as we could be right now. They're, they're, they're farther apart than it looks. Kind of like the rearview mirror on your side of your thing. Objects appear closer than they really are. Uh, that's how these people are. So, uh, but they're here, and, and you're where you are, and we're believing God has something amazing to speak to our hearts today. And I'm grateful for all the, all the hardworking people that you won't see on the camera, that are behind the camera and in the production room, and that did a lot of work this week that you won't see, uh, because without them, this isn't possible. So I'm grateful to them. I, I'm grateful that you're making it happen and you're trying to make the best of this, uh, you're going to have an amazing morning with you and your family in your living room, or it could just be you and God uh, by yourself, and that's great too. I believe God is going to meet you. He has a special word for us today, and so thank you for making the effort, uh, because historically the church has actually always grown and been strengthened in times of difficulty and tribulation. And it's no different for us right now. The, the reality and the amazing truth is God is growing us in the middle of this pressure. He's refining us. So I am very hopeful though, one day very soon, we're gonna be gathering together again as the physical community of faith and we're going to be different because of it. That's what I hope and that's what I believe that on the other side of this, things are going to be different. There's going to be some things that change and are going to be better. And it, uh, hopefully what, what, what comes out of this isn't just that we're better at live streaming, as wonderful as that is. Hopefully what comes out of this is that we're not just better at doing online content. And I thank God for this, that we're growing in this. And there's going to be ways that we reach people that we would have never reached otherwise because we've been forced into this situation a little bit. And God's going to take what the enemy meant for harm and he's going to use it for our good and the glory of his name. I believe that. But in the middle of this, I believe the greatest thing that we're going to come out on the other side of this is being changed, being different. We're going to come out on the other side as the church, the people of God, with a limp, but we're going to be stronger. We're going to be more grateful. We're going to be more loving, more kind, and the gospel is going to go forth like never before in the earth as we become who we're supposed to be in Christ as his church. That's what's going to happen because of this. So we're not going to just get through this together. We're going to grow through this together. God's going to do something great in his church. Now, alluding to walking with a limp is a great tie-in to our week three subject as we continue our series, Discovering Christ in the Old Testament. Today, I want to look at one of the great stories surrounding the life of Jacob, particularly his wrestling match with God. Now, I'm sure all of you know a little bit about wrestling, and um, I'm not talking about collegiate wrestling. I'm talking about the real wrestling, like the real fake wrestling. Um, and so I, I know that WWE, and this is not that. This is a, the early precursor, if you will, to WWE, and it, it's called WWG. I, I know you're all laughing at home right now at that dad joke, so... So it could be wrestling with God. That, all right. So, all right. So Genesis 28, 
And we're going to be looking at our Bible. So if you have your Bible with you today at home or using version or whatever you might be using, let's turn to Genesis 28 where we're going to look at the account of Jacob clinging to the promise of God through a divine wrestling match. So as a bit of a recap, last week we talked about Abraham and the promise of God to Abraham and how those promises have been passed down to us if we put our faith in Jesus Christ. That a child of Abraham is another name for a person who lives by faith in Christ alone. But there's more in the Old Testament leading up to Jesus, pointing towards and foreshadowing Jesus than just the story of Abraham. There's a lot more that happens in between Abraham and Jesus, if you will, appearing. So as a a matter of fact, Jesus is the person to whom and from all history flows. So as we look back at these 39 books, we can see Jesus in all of these books in the Old Testament as together with the New Testament, they tell one grand story of redemption. Some of the premise of this series is that we cannot neglect the largest portion of Scripture, God's Word, and know God the way that we're supposed to, completely and wholly. So if you're taking notes, as we've said last week, here's the point. The more fully we know God, the more holy we will love God. The more completely we look at him and, and, and his word, the better we will know him. I don't want to just partially know about God. I want to know as much as I can through his word, the Bible. So we must learn to know God and see Jesus through the totality of scriptures, both new and old, because they tell one great love story about our God. And the more we grasp from the entirety of the Bible, the deeper our love for God and our love for people becomes. So let's start with the promise that God gives to Jacob in Genesis chapter 28. We're going to start in verse 14. It says this, Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So this is God coming to Jacob now for the first time, revealing himself to Jacob to confirm the Abrahamic covenant with him. This time he's using the dust of the earth instead of the stars of the sky that he did with Jacob's grandfather, Abraham, but the same promise from the same God to the same line. Interestingly enough, this is when Jacob, if you read the story in Genesis 28, this is when Jacob is actually leaving the land of Canaan because he's in a fight with his brother Esau, which he has deceived and stolen his birthright and all this crazy stuff, right? You you can read it later on if you'd like, but Jacob is fleeing the land of the promise with his brother. He's fleeing the place that God's saying he's supposed to be. And isn't it reassuring as we look at this that when you're seemingly walking away from the land of promise, when it seems like you're walking away from the things that God has for you, the places God has for you, that our loving Father comes and reassures us that the deal is still on, that the promise is still going to take place. I know what it looks like right now, Jacob. I know that it looks like you're walking away from the things that I promised you, but know this, I've got a plan, and you've got to trust me. And here's Jacob, and it's basically a process towards the promise. It's one where he's going to have to trust God more than he ever has before. As we said last week, there's a preparation that takes place on the way to receiving the promises of God. There's a perseverance that takes place to the promise of God. And Jacob was about to go through both, a process and some perseverance. So let's jump forward, if we can, to chapter 31. And we're going to look at starting in verse 3 of this particular chapter in Genesis. And this now is 20 years later. Say it with me. 20 years. They did good on this side. Y'all did it. 20 years. Here's this this 20-year process, right? Like, okay, well, I'm going to leave the land, and and God's going to work this out, and I'm going to do a U-turn and get back here really quick. No, 20 years of Jacob. And, and he's wandering in, le- in essence, but yet he's receiving the blessing of God, but he's also receiving growth through perseverance. So let's read this. In verse 3, it says, God's saying, it's time. This is what he's saying. The Lord said to Jacob, return to the land of your fathers and to your kindred, and I will be with you. 20 years later, he's told to go back to the land of the promise. After two decades of struggle and receiving God's blessing, don't you know that Jacob is a different man? Just like hopefully you and I are different people 
after 20 years, if you've been walking with God that long, that, that 20 years ago, you're not the same person you are today or however long it is, two years, two months, you're not the same person through the things that you've been through, both good and bad, because life is a dance between joy and pain and, and victory and defeat, it seems like at times. And even in all of those things that we go through in this difficulty of life, God is changing us and transforming us so that we're not the same person anymore. Jacob's not the same, but there was still some struggle to get to the promise. Still more to this story, because the problem was he was going back to the land of the promise, but it is occupied by his enemy, his brother Esau, who's looking for the first opportunity. That's why he fled. He's looking for the first opportunity to take Jacob out. I hope dad dies, because when dad dies, Isaac, I'm going to kill my brother, and it's going to be over. So before there's any imminent peril, because Jacob is making his way back to the land of promise, and he's probably really nervous about it, he's probably struggling, he's afraid, what's going to happen to me and my family? And here God meets him on his journey back to the land of promise, before there's any imminent peril. So let's read, before he's even under the threat of his brother, here's what happens in Genesis 32 now, verse 1 and 2. You can turn there, 32, verse 1 and 2. He says this, Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. That actually means two hosts or two camps. A a lot of commentators and, and, and people that study this have said that it's like, it was almost like a rear guard and a front guard. It was like God saying, listen, I've been with you all this time and I'm behind you and we're gonna get you to where we're taking you, but God is also ahead of you. It's a promise that God is with us, that he's always with us. He's our rear guard. He's in front of us. He's beside us. And, and here's this angelic host greeting Jacob back into the promised land. I mean, that's, that's some serious stuff right there. Surprise, we're here waiting on you. And it's an awesome reminder to Jacob that God, the God of the promise, is also the guard and the keeper of the promise. Aren't you glad that the God of the promise is the one who guards the promise and keeps the promise? That that's not up to me. The God of the promise kept and protected the land of the promise. But this is a pretty amazing welcoming party, one that would be encouraging, I'm sure, to Jacob and maybe terrifying. But here's why. There's some serious dangers that are ahead and that were coming that God is still preparing Jacob for by reassuring him that those who know and fear the Lord don't have anything to fear from anybody else. That if God is for you, then who can be against you? And here's this welcoming party saying, listen, you're about to re-enter the land of the promise that is now being held by someone who wants to kill you. But before you get to that threat, we want you to know that if God is for you, the one who gave you the promise is the one who's been protecting and guarding the land of the promise so that you can enter in. And the timing here shouldn't be lost on us. Before there was a battle, he's being reassured. It's before the trial, before the encounter with his brother, God's coming to reassure him. The deal is still on, Jacob. This is going to happen. I'm going to fulfill my promise. When God purposes his people for extraordinary trials, he prepares them by extraordinary reassurances. This was an extraordinary reassurance, an angelic welcoming party. The angel of the Lord's about to show up. And Jacob, when all is said and done, is going to be reassured by God that the land of the promise belongs to him. See, it's oftentimes, as we look at this, in times of peace that we're being prepared for the most for the times of tribulation and turmoil that are coming. It's in times of peace that God prepares us the most for the times of peril that it's coming. It's too late to shore up the levees of your house, if you will, when the flood has already reached the shore. It's too late to to shore up the foundations of our lives when the, the storm has already hit. This is why Jesus later on said, listen, if you're going to build your house, you need to build it on a sure foundation because there's some foundations, you and other things, that will give way in the storm and there's one foundation in Christ that will withstand and it's in this moment that we see God preparing him through reassurances and all too often we we don't look for God when he is to be found not that he can't be found but that we're not looking for him And we claim the battle is the Lord's but we've not spent time with God to allow him to prepare us for battle 
I believe when we are in times of peace is when God prepares us the most to provide for us in times of peril and trouble so that when trouble comes, and it will, we can live upon the earlier observations and experiences with our heavenly Father and our time with God. This is what it means to walk by faith and not by sight. Now, if you're in a situation right now like many of us are, but maybe it's different and unique for you in some ways, and you've not turned to God ever before in your life, do not be condemned because at any point that you turn to Jesus and ask for his help, he is there with you to save you. It's just some of us have not realized that we needed saving until now. Others of us know this, and these times, these times of peace, maybe about four weeks ago, three weeks ago, what did your life look like? Were you spending time with your father as he was trying to prepare you for what he knew was coming that you had no idea was coming? This is important, why we spend time with God so that he's changing us and preparing us for all that he already knows is ahead of us. So Jacob does all he can to appease his brother. This is a smart move. See, Esau's ticked. Esau's mad. Esau is sending 400 men, and he knows this. And this isn't a welcoming party. This is I'm going to kill you party. And he, so Jacob is doing what any wise person would do. He makes plans to protect his family. It's kind of like, you know, growing up as a kid, and maybe you did this with your parents. You try to butter them up before you'd ask them the big question that you knew they probably were going to say no to, right? So it's like, you want to do something now. I know my kids have never done this to me, but I did this maybe to my parents, and maybe you've done this to your parents. I'm kidding. They, it's like, why are you being so nice? Why are you taking out the trash? You never do that. Why did you clean the toilet in your bathroom? That never happens, right? You knew at that point, right, somebody was about to ask something. So you do something all day long, and then right before, and you've been, you know the question. You just act like it just popped into your head, though, right? We've all done that. Oh, oh by the way, I just thought I'd ask, could, could, could I go to the beach with my friends next weekend, just the five of us? Like You're like 17, and, and the answer is no, you can't. So, but you did all that you could. You sent, you sent ahead all that you could, just like Jacob is sending ahead cattle and, and livestock and all these things he's sending ahead. It's like gifts. And basically, this is why he's saying, I'm sorry, Esau. Please forgive me, Esau. I'm sorry for what I've done. And he's trying his best to do all that he knows to do. And here's what Jacob knows. And here's what we need to know. He's doing all he knows to do. He's doing wise things. And then he's going to let God do what only God can do. And that's what you need to do right now, my friend. This is where we all are at in life, always. We do all we know to do, even in this situation. You know, we social distance, we, we do virtual church, we wash our hands, we, we do all that we can, we do all the wise things we can, and then we let God do what only God can do. Because what I know and what you know right now is we're not in control, but God is. He's sovereign. So I do all I know to do, and I trust God to do what only he can do. This is an encouragement for you today. Let's pick up in Genesis 32, and we're going to start here in verse 23. He took them and sent them across the stream. This would be his family, right? He's dividing up everything, his caravan, and he's going to send his family one way so that in case Esau isn't favorable towards him and kills him, that at least his family might have time to get away. So he sends them across the stream and everything else that he had. Verse 24, and Jacob was left alone. Let's stop right there. I want that to just settle in your living room right now, wherever you may be. Maybe you are alone right now. You're by yourself. And I want you to know that God is with you wherever you are. Because at some point in time in your life, as great as it is to be with these people in my family, in my spiritual family, and pray with the corporate gathering and, and pray with other believers, as great as that is, there is a time in all of our lives, many times, but at least one time in particular, where we all come to a place where we're all alone and there's nothing but you and God. Nothing but the two of you where you have nowhere else to turn to but God alone. And when that's the case, that's just perfectly fine because he's always been right there. He's there with you when there's nothing left to lean on, nothing left to depend on, nothing left to trust in. The foundations that you put your hope in are giving way. God is there. And I hope that encourages you today because I know a lot of us are feeling alone and isolated. And I want you to know God will meet you in that place. And it goes on to say, verse 24, Four, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. 
till the breaking of the day. Now, Jacob is in a wrestling match with a strange figure, and we're not talking about the fake performance idiocy that I mentioned a moment ago. As much as I, I loved that, as much as I loved going to wrestling as a kid, and I believed that it was real, and I would, for those of you who are from this area, I'd go down to the Bell Auditorium, it was called at the time, and, and we would watch these live wrestling matches, WCW, and we'd see people like Abdullah the Butcher and, and uh, Big Red and Bad Bad Leroy Brown. These are all probably local guys, but they were great, and I loved it but it's so not real. So I hate it for those of you who think that it still is, but it's fake. Don't turn off your screen. Keep watching this, because it's real. Okay, there you go. And he's wrestling with this guy, and we're talking about a divine struggle with God himself appearing as a man. This is a theophany, a visible appearance of God in the Old Testament. And it was also something that would not have been abnormal for someone in the Near East at this time to have settled a legal case with a trial by combat. I am so glad that we don't do that today. I mean, as strong as I am, I am so glad that we don't have to settle things by a trial by combat. But Jacob would have understood this. People that would have known this story, this would have made sense a little bit differently than it does to us today because Jacob is seeking the blessing of God, the blessing of God's promise to him in a wrestling match. And God's not the one on trial here. It's Jacob. And is he going to be determined enough to prevail and put his trust in God? Verse 25, when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. The word touched here means torn or ruptured. Now what we do know is if a wrestler does not have his strength, the strength of his legs, then the match was as good as over. What I know about real wrestling is if you don't have the strength of your legs and you don't have the foundation to make the moves that you need to make, then you are as good as done. The match is over. But for Jacob, he was determined that the match was not going to end that way. He was determined that this was not how this fight was going to go down. He could not win in his own strength, but if he couldn't win in his own strength, that he was going to prevail in his weakness. Man, that's good. His leg gave way, but his grip did not. And it it really foreshadows a prayer that Nehemiah prayed years later when he was building the wall and he around Jerusalem and he was saying, God, I don't know how this project's going to take place, but if you would strengthen the grip of my hands, basically saying, God, I need to hold on to your promises. You said you were going to do this. You said you were going to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem. So I am clinging to your promise right now. And when Jacob could not fight because he could not put his hope in his own strength any longer, when he had nothing to do but endure pain, he was clinging to the promise of God because it was more painful for him not to have God's blessing than the pain that he was going through in his hip. I'm gonna cling to God. Verse 26, then he said, let me go for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. But he said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. The Lord blessed Jacob. And this is, there's just so much in this particular series of scriptures, but Jacob's victory in the match is not a conquest of God. It's not that he bested the angel of the Lord. He was lame, he was crippled, he was helpless, he was able to do nothing except what? Cling to the God who had laid hold of him first. All he could do in his weakness was cling to the God who had initiated this fight in the first place. Faith wins when it knows all is lost except to cling to God alone. That's what I said a moment ago. You're going to find yourself in this life at some point alone with God, wrestling with him. I believe this indicates at this point Jacob's willingness to submit himself to God's demands on him. Jacob's persistence, which he used to use to work for his advantage, for deceiving and manipulating people, is now working for his benefit. He's going to be persistent. 
Isn't it amazing that the things that God's put in us that are just natural inclinations, he begins, that we used to use for our selfish gain, he'll begin to change and use for his glory and our good when we are submitted wholly to him. I'm so grateful for that. Now this persistence is being used for good things and he's ready to do whatever it takes. And maybe that's where you are today or you've come to that place in life. God, I'm, now, I'm ready to do whatever it takes to be yours. And the blessing comes in the form of a name change. This is significant for Jacob since his name had embodied his character throughout this entire narrative of his life. A name change therefore signifies a character change. And Jacob's name is changed to Israel now. He's no longer a deceiver, but now he is Israel, which means Jacob has prevailed with God. Acknowledging that Jacob's desperate faith in God has been rewarded with God's presence and God's promise. Is it any different for you and me? That if you come to a place of struggle with God, where you're wrestling with him, and you're clinging to him alone, when you realize all is lost with God, without him, that you're lost and you cling to him as your savior and Lord by grace through faith, one of the blessings that we receive is a name change which signifies a character change in our life. We will never be the same again. We're gonna go from orphan to son or daughter. We're gonna go from a servant to a friend. We're going to go from a prisoner to one who's set free, from one who is dead to one who is alive, Galatians 4, 7. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. See, the struggle with God is not to get our way. So often we enter into the four the, the, the ring, if you will, and we, we enter into this ring with God and we say, listen, I'm going to fight with God to get my way. No, I'm not fighting with God to get my way. The struggle with God is not to get our way. The struggle with God is to get us out of the way so God can have his way with us. If that's where you are today, the struggle that you're in is not so that you can get what you want, so that you can get what you need. God and God alone. So take note of what God did when he wrestled Jacob. Jacob began the night dreading Esau's arrival. He was full of fear and desperation, but he ended the night of struggle with God's blessing and reassurance and a renewed faith in the God of the promise. You see, wrestling with God for my own way will lead to ruin. If I'm gonna wrestle with God to get my way and I get my way, I promise it's gonna lead to my ruin. But if I wrestle with God in faith, it will lead to peace. I can think of many times in my life where I was wrestling with God for my own way. And when I got it, it wasn't good. Or if I didn't get it, I was so grateful later on. Verse 30, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose up upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. So in the dimness of this early morning, the break of dawn, if you will, Jacob gazed upon the face of God and was spared. Jacob then limps toward this tense reunion with his brother Esau, not knowing how Esau's going to respond, with a weakened body, but a strengthened faith. Having wrestled with God, he knows his prayers regarding Esau are going to be answered because he knew after seeing the face of God, there was not any reason for him to fear the face of Esau. See, that's what happens for us. When we come out on the other side, we know that there's no reason to fear whatever we may be facing today. Whatever you may be facing today, the fear, the anxiety that surrounds that will melt in the presence of being face to face with God. So I encourage you to do that. Jacob began the night believing his greatest need was to escape his brother. He ended the night believing his greatest need was to trust in the blessing of God's promise. And what changed him from a fearing man to trusting God's word was a prolonged, painful wrestling match with the Lord. Sometimes in your battle with unbelief and fear and doubt, and that's probably where a lot of us are right now, your greatest friend is going to end up wrestling you. Your greatest ally, which is God himself, might even make you limp until you're desperate enough to say, I will not let you go unless you bless me. It's God 
God's great mercy that is brought upon us to bring us to the place where we're desperate enough to insist on what we need, that we would hold on to for dear life, to insist on what we need than rather to get what we think we want. God, I insist that you not leave me or forsake me but that you would fulfill your promises as it relates to your word and concerns me. Now let's talk about this theophany with a little bit of remaining time as God's revelation points towards and forward to Jesus Christ. That's why I say we see Jesus Christ in every page of the Bible. First we see Jesus appear in this narrative as the Lord. That's who he is, that's his name. When he said, who do people say that I am? You are Christ the Lord, that's his name, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And this divine manifestation is more than symbolic. It's a divine appearing that anticipates the incarnation. When the King of kings and the Lord of lords would come to earth to be near to us. This is why it's called a theophany or Christophany. So we said a moment ago, it appears that Jacob wins this wrestling match, but it is actually the Lord that wins. See, the Lord cannot escape crippled Jacob's desperate grasp without giving him the prize that he is contending for. Yet, losing, it appears, the Lord actually wins. He suffers an apparent defeat to gain true victory. The weakness of God in this wrestling match is stronger than the greatest strength of men. The Lord of glory humbles himself so that this helpless sinner, Jacob, could receive his blessing that he is begging for. A helpless beggar. Does any of this sound familiar? Because it should if you see Jesus in his word. Because Jesus later on would suffer an apparent defeat on the cross and it turned out to be the death of death instead. 1 Corinthians 1.25 says, For the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Paul is talking about Christ crucified two verses prior. It's a submission to a shameful death which would absolutely look weak and foolish to those who are looking on. This could not be an activity of God to be hanging from a cross. It's shameful, and yet this weakness, this apparent weakness to our human eyes is actually stronger than men's greatest strength as in that moment through it, God conquered sin and death and hell and the grave through the shame of the cross. Or how about when Jesus said to his disciples, the same thing that he would say to you and I today. How do we become disciples? He said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Which looks foolish to the world around us. Looks weak to the world around us. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's keep going with this amazing foreshadowing of Jesus in the Old Testament. As the face of the Lord is too glorious for Jacob to look at, and yet the Lord himself comes to Jacob so that he could know him in a more personal way. He reveals himself to him in a more personal way. His coming to Jacob in that way, face to face, anticipated Christ coming to us. Jacob saw the face of the Lord dimly. We see the light of the glory of God's face through the face of Jesus Christ. This is what 2 Corinthians 4 verse 6 says. For God, who said, let light shine out of the darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The other way we see Jesus appear in this narrative is the role of Jacob anticipates the coming of Jesus as God's servant. Not that he would just be the Lord, but he would also be a servant. Jesus was the suffering servant of God. As Isaiah points out, he endured pain, just like if Jacob was enduring pain to cling to God. Jesus endured pain because he was smitten by God, stricken by him, and afflicted, Isaiah said. There's a connection between Jacob's wrestling in the darkness of Peniel and Jesus' wrestling with God in the darkness of the Garden of Gethsemane. And yet Jesus was able to fulfill the calling that the sinner Jacob could only foreshadow. so powerful. I have a question for you today. In light of this story, in light of what God's doing, what do you really need from God right now? What blessing do you want from God right now? How badly do you want it? There are times when God only releases his blessings on us after a season of prolonged struggle 
or even painful wrestling with him. And I believe in many ways right now, this is where our world and our nation is. We're contending with God. We're wrestling with God right now. And on the other side, if we will come to the same place that both Jacob and Jesus came to, a place of humility of God, not my will, but your will be done, that if we will contend with God that way, then he's going to bring us to that place of humility and by his great mercy, he's gonna take us to a place where we see him face to face and realize we're desperate enough now to insist on what we need the most. And what we need the most, my friends, is Jesus. What we need most is not a cure for a virus, as as, as amazing as that is, and, and I believe that it will happen, but what we need most is a cure for something that only Jesus can cure, and that's our sin. And maybe this will come in a way that you didn't expect, like a quarantine. Maybe this will come in a way that you realize who Jesus is and and what he truly means to you in a wrestling match like this that you didn't expect or ask for. You didn't solicit for this, and yet here we are. See, if necessary, God will cause all of us to limp if it means it will increase our faith. This is a place where we realize that his strength is made perfect in our weakness. Isn't that what scripture tells us? And as we said, wrestling with, struggling with God changed Jacob's name. It changed his character. It changed his identity. He was no longer going to be known as a deceiver who was able to receive blessings through deception, which he had done in the past. But now he would be known as one who received God's blessing by prevailing with God in humble faith. When God calls us to wrestle with him, there's always more going on than what we see because God sees it all and we only see in part. But we can be assured that what God is doing is always going to transform us for his glory and our good. I believe God still wants to bless us. It's just that he has more blessings for us in the wrestling matches than he does in our lives without them. Remember, God pursued Jacob for this match. God was the initiator of this wrestling match, just as God is the initiator of the place that you're in right now. Jacob was all in his anxious feelings about Esau. He was all fearful about Esau coming to kill him and coming to kill his family. He was doing all he knew to do. And I'm not saying all that he was doing was right. He was doing all he knew to do to try to assuage his brother and try to make it work in his own strength still. I'm going to appease him. I'm going to send some gifts. I'm going to make this work. I can do this. Oh, I I need help, but I'm going to do this. But then God shows up while he's all in his feelings. God shows up and the wrestling forced Jacob out of his fearful preoccupation with his circumstances and his fear about his brother and made him focus on God alone. The struggle was a means of God's grace and a vehicle to bless Jacob. And I believe the same is true for us today. Many of us have had our own preoccupations with everything but God. And now we've got a preoccupation with fear and anxiety. And God is taking us to a place where it's just going to be you and him alone. Maybe in the closet of your house, figuratively or literally. And he's going to take you there so that you can be no longer preoccupied with the things that are scaring you and have you afraid but he's going to have you wrestling with him so you can get what you need the most, and that is to see him face to face. Stay with God. Here's what I encourage you to do in this time, because your wrestling match is going to be probably one in prayer. Stay with God. Don't give up. Be tenacious. Persevere. God loves and rewards that kind of faith. And if you'll do that, you're going to come out on the other side transformed. Yes, you may have a limp, but you're going to be transformed. And other people are going to notice that you've been with God. He's not just going to bless you, but he's going to use you to be a blessing to others. And all of this is good news for us today. And I'll close. Because today it further describes the promises of God that are available in Christ to all who call on his name. 2 Corinthians 1.20 says all of the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus so that every sinner who comes to God in Christ with all of his needs finds God coming to him in Christ with all of his promises. Man, that's such an amazing trade-off. So when you come to him, a sinful person meets God in Christ, he just hears a litany of yeses. 
Do you love me? Yes. Will you forgive me? Yes. Will you accept me? Yes. Will you help me change? Yes. Will you give me power to serve you? Yes. Will you keep me? Yes. Will you show me your glory? Yes. Will you provide your promises to my life? Yes, yes, and yes. All the blessings of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. Jesus is God's divine yes, his decisive yes to everything that God has promised. And that's for you and that's for me if we will call on his name and cling to his promises by grace through faith in Christ alone. Now we're about to sing one final song. And as I do that, I'm going to encourage you to pray with me. I'm actually going to encourage you to bow your head and close your eyes. I know that might feel a little different because we're on a, on a screen. And I, but please do that. Shut out all the distractions. I know that a lot of you have a lot of things going on around you. But let's just pray right now. And let's just ask God as we begin to change the stage around a little bit and our worship team gets ready to sing. I want to pray with you.